Well, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Will you believe with me today that I'm going to preach in such a way that I don't blow the stitches out of my mouth? Can you do that? <laughs> I had a tooth extracted on Friday and did graduation, but, you know, I just needed to read Scripture for the charge. But I preach. So, you know, I'm like, Lord, thank you that you're going to let my stitches stay in my mouth. Amen. You won't see me spit them out here in a minute. <laughs> The Lord is good. You know what? I could always have somebody else minister because we have such a depth of people. Um, but, you know, Pastor Mike, he doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to have him minister on Wednesday. You say, wow, you're just now telling him right in front of everybody? Sure. He's instant in season and out. I mean, man, if he can't bring a word, we'd be in trouble. But at the end of the day, I don't, I'm listening because I was like, Lord, who needs to speak? You know, I, I as a pastor, have this privilege, this like, um, you know, really, I'm just kind of in awe that I have so many individuals that we could call up in a moment's notice that are well equipped to minister the word of God. Amen. And um, I'm just so thankful for that. You know, so I mean, it, it's not like, you know, okay, I got one person, my associate, they have to always do that. Right. I don't have that issue. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody doing good? All right. So with that being said, Pastor Mike, thank you. All right. <laughs> Ephesians chapter one. Um, today, I want to talk to you about some things, you know, that help us keep ourselves straight. We've said this in years past, you know, uh, God is the author of words. So he has the right to define them. You know, there's a lot of redefining going on in our planet right now. Right. There's a lot of redefining of terms. Well, you know, the church needs to redefine some things. Because the church has even gotten into some things called tradition. Jesus addressed this with a, very, with a religious group of people when he walked on the planet. It was found in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, when he said, Why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? You're going to need to change your thinking. You're going to have to change your definition, your way of living me. Are you hearing me? His whole Sermon on the Mount was a disruption. You've heard the ancients say, which is his father through the prophets, thou shalt not. But I say unto you, which means Jesus said, I'm giving you a right interpretation of this thing. Because y'all have made it a surface issue, and I'm telling you, it's always was about a heart. That even if on the surface you were able to accomplish something, your heart has condemned you. Has put you in a bad spot, right? And so he addresses this situation, this issue that takes place. And so, um, you know, we ourselves have to make sure that we get rid of all religion, tr religious traditions. Because, you know, if we don't watch out, the Bible can become a religious book. Right? We have a thing called a freedom of what? Religion. But yet the Bible is actually not even a religious book. It's about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring. The Bible is actually a historical document of the nation of its ups and downs, of God's desire to place humanity within his kingdom where he rules and reigns and we reign with him. The cool thing about God's kingdom, it's not a kingdom of servants, although we serve. It's a kingdom of kings. The Bible says he's the king of? Who are those kings? You are. He's the Lord of? Who are those lords? You are. Which means you're not in supreme, you're not the one who's supreme in authority, he is, but you have the supreme authority of how to live your life. The devil can't make you do something, sin can't make you do something. Once you've been redeemed, you have the authority to say no to sin. You're no longer subject to it because you've been delivered out of its power. Are you hearing me? We've been transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We would be pathetic species if we had to stay bound to our old ruler in a new kingdom. If we had to. But we don't. Because whom the son has set is indeed. Say, I'm free. Say, I'm free. Now, deliverance and freedom are two different things. Because many people get delivered, but they never get free. Why? Because their mind stays with the old master. But you got to renew your mind to the new one, King Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Well, with that being said, I want to talk to you about kingdom forgiveness. Because forgiveness is a big deal when it comes to the kingdom of God. But I'm concerned that we've not, we've kind of gotten off in this thing called forgiveness. In fact, we've gotten a little religious in it. And we're going to clearly see the difference between a religious forgiveness and a kingdom forgiveness. Are you hearing me? So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, Paul says this, Blessed be the God of our Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. That we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intentions of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass. One translation says of, of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us, which he lavished on us. Now, I want to take a moment here. I don't want to go too far in depth because I got quite a few scriptures this morning, which is not unusual for us. Um, but I want to look at a few things. The first thing I want us to look at is verse 4, that he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Now, just because you're chosen before something doesn't mean you'll walk in it. Right. Are you hearing me? I'll give you another scripture that helps support this. God desires that all would repent, come to repentance. That none would perish. That how many would perish? None. And that all, how many? All would come to repentance. Will all come to repentance? Will some perish? Will many actually perish? They actually will. So God has a desire. So before the foundations of the world, before he created the world, the United States, or I mean, not the, you know, the earth itself, okay? God already had an idea of how he wanted humanity. And he wanted them in Christ. He wanted them in a king's anointing. Because Christ means the king who will come and establish his kingdom and there will be no end. Christ is the anointed one in his anointed. And that's what you do with kings. You anoint them. And Jesus was anointed. Yes. Remember, he was anointed when he came out of the Jordan River. The Holy Spirit came upon him. Later on in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, and look, uh, he said, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me, for he has anointed me. Acts chapter 10, 38 says, look how Jesus of Nazareth ran around doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil, whom the Father had anointed. Look how God anointed Jesus. So Jesus had an anointing. It's a king's anointing. And if he has that anointing, we have that anointing. Are you hearing me? So he always saw that us, as human, those created in his likeness, would reign. That's why in Genesis 1, before sin ever enters the earth, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Genesis 1, 26, and let them rule, have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over all the cattle, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, over all the earth. Both male and female were to have dominion or rulership. In essence, Jesus is king. We are his kings underneath. And we serve in his earth to cause heaven, it to look like heaven on earth. Are you hearing me? This was always God's design. So he chose us. In him, in the likeness of God, before the foundations of the world. But Adam sinned. And because he sinned, sin entered the earth. Sin brings death, which is an eternal punishment. Now, what is sin? Sin is simply disobeying the word of God. Because it's through Adam's transgression or Adam's um, sin. What was his sin? He ate the fruit. God said, do not eat. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when he ate that fruit, God had to institute an amendment to his word because his word is in effect. If you eat the fruit, you what? Die. And is, human, is humanity still in a dead state today? A majority of them. 
So the only way they can come back to life is he had to send his own son. Are you hearing me? Because God is obligated to his word. He said, if you eat the fruit, the day you eat it, you'll die. Now, death has a wage because sin has a wage. Death is the wage of sin. So God has to pay for that. And only God could pay for it. Now, in order to pay for it, he can't use silver and gold. Because silver and gold cannot pay for your eternal security. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you can't buy your way into heaven. You can't give your way into heaven. You can't do more good according to your estimation than bad, and it work for God. God's not impressed with your giving. He's not impressed with your social work. He's not impressed with you feeding the poor. If you're feeding the poor only to get his attention. Are you hearing me? Because I know there was a guy who took care of the poor and God heard it. But yet he did more than just take care of the poor. He was seeking the Lord. And the Lord sent a message so that he could become born again. Are you hearing me? So in order for us to get back into the family, we must be born of the family that we were, were out of. And it's the blood of Jesus. He says we were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus. Not with it, a perishable type of currency like silver and gold, but with the what? Precious blood of Jesus. By all rights, Jesus' death on the cross and his blood that he shed was a financial transaction so that you could come back into the family. He paid your debt. And all of humanity is in debt to God. For the wages of sin is death, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, so they all need the blood. I said they all need the blood. Blood is what causes forgiveness to manifest. Are you hearing me? Because he goes on to say this, that it, we, we were redeemed through his blood. Now understand, when he says in verse 5, he predestined, all that means is, is that God has predestined a path for humans to be able of their own free will to get on. There's a lot of false doctrine out there called predestination, meaning there are people who are already predestined to be in and there are those aren't. That's not true. Just because God knows who's getting in doesn't mean it's still not their will to get in. They have to choose because if God says, this group I'm going to keep, this group I'm not, and it's his choice, then he is not just. He's not just. He's just because he gives all of humanity the opportunity. This is the way. Come on, you know what the way is, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. How do you get to him? You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord of your life. But there's something that must take place in the believe. And that's what we need to key on today because many people, you know, know that God forgives. But how do you, how do you actually receive that forgiveness? All right. Let's go on. Matthew 26, 27, and 28. Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 and 28 says, And when he had taken a cup and gave, gave, given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Well, how many did he pour it out for? Many. How many are many? That's every person ever. That's every person ever. Yet, not every person ever will have forgiveness. Hallelujah. Although the blood is there for forgiveness. Now, we need to get this in context because when we read this, we got to understand Jesus is doing something in a way that has already been done, but it's temporary. 
Jesus is not doing something that, oh, well, you know, we're going to do something new. Jesus is doing something that creates finality. We find this in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it has to do with sacrifices of the old covenant and why they did sacrifices. And look what it says here. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no... Now, you know what took place. The high priest would go in once a year and sprinkle the blood everywhere from a lamb that was without spot or wrinkle, an animal that had no defect because that's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ who was the man who knew no sin but became our sin. And every year they had to do this. Yet, throughout the year, there were other sacrifices based upon festivals, based upon knowingly sinning and not knowingly sinning that needed to take place. Why? Because if the blood's not there, then forgiveness is not there. And every year, the high priest had to go on the Day of Atonement for what purpose? To apply blood so the nation could remain in covenant with every year. Because every year, they were sinning. So another animal dies. Another animal dies. Another animal dies. Let's go on. It says this. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Because you understand the tabernacle or the the holies of holies is a copy of what actually exists in heaven. This is why Moses couldn't build it according to his own design because there's a copy in another world. In another realm. All right. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. How? For us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been made manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And insomuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. How many? And how many are many? That's everybody will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So you need to understand that the blood of Jesus still runs today. Which means there's no reason to have to sacrifice again for you because blood is still flowing for anything you ever do. Now, why do I say that? Because many interpret this as Christ has paid for everything. Yet, in one sense, many will still go to the second or go to have the experience the second death, which is the lake of fire, even though blood is flowing on the mercy seat. Even though it's flowing. So unlike the Old Covenant, which, again, in the Old Covenant, there was something that occurred that in order, that allowed that blood to take hold of the nation. And in the New Covenant, the same thing. There is something that is required in order for that blood to take hold of your life. If you do not do what's required, although the blood's been applied... It doesn't apply to you, although it applies for you. Something can be applied for you, but yet not applied to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I can go to the bank and make a deposit for you, but unless you withdraw it, it does nothing for you. 
It doesn't bring your deliverance. It doesn't set you free. You're dying of cancer, and you need $12,000 to be able to do some medical treatment. I put in the account, you know, $50 billion for you because it's more than enough. <laughs> but you won't go to the account to withdraw what I've already deposited. So you die in your cancer, not because it wasn't there. So you got to understand what Jesus has done, yes, is for the world, but it only applies to those within the world should they do what's required to receive it. Are you hearing me? Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. For this reason, also since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of its will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified, who has what? qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of life. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So verse 12 tells us we're qualified. Guess what? If I deposited $50 billion in your account and you need 25,000 out, I've qualified you to go get it. Are you hearing me? But if you don't go get it, then you don't have what you're qualified for. Now this sounds semantics, but it's not. Because there are many people that are going to go to the lake of fire because they believe God's already forgiven them, yet they've not received it. Because has God provided forgiveness? Yes. Provision of forgiveness is not forgiveness. I'm going to say that again. Provision of forgiveness is not forgiveness. Because again, if the blood of Jesus, which we know has been poured out for all mankind's sin, and is that done? Is it finished? Is it on the mercy seat in heaven? And if that's all that was necessary, then we don't need to pray. We don't need to come to church. We shouldn't even witness. At this point, we have what is called the doctrine of inclusion. Christ has already done it all. We can't do anything. We're all going. There really isn't a hell anyway. Because we're all God's loving people. He's already forgiven us. He's paid the price with blood. Well, he has paid the price with blood. But there are still plenty of people that are living according to the devil and are children of the devil and are not getting in to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. They are not going to have eternal life with Christ. They will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. They will be at the great white throne judgment, knowing that the account was paid in full. But they did not do what was required to receive. Didn't do it. Amen. So we don't want to create a false reality to the world in trying to be simple. I just want you to know God's already forgiven you. God has already provided forgiveness for you. So this is not an issue about what you've done. But if you want it, this is what you must do. That's how we should say this. Instead of saying, you know, God's already forgiven you. Oh, he's already forgiven me? Yeah. It's like you've never done it. Wow, this is awesome. Well, why would you have to do anything different then? Jesus has provided forgiveness for everything you've done. He's done that. But if you'll do this, you can receive that forgiveness. And it'd be as if it never happened. Do you understand? Blood is running on the mercy seat, but God's still taking notes of your life. He's still taking notes, and he's taking notes for the believer and the unbeliever, for uh, the saved and the lost. He is taking notes. I like to say it this way. God is the greatest micromanager. There's nothing you're doing that he's not recording. 
Why? Because he loves to reward. Now, the only problem is a reward can be bad. You can get a bad reward. You can be rewarded for bad things, which is death, separation, or, you know, things that don't make it to his realm. Because the Bible says for us that are born again, when we go before the judgment seat of Christ, because again, thrones are in kingdoms, not religion. We need to leave fantasy land of Jesus and religion and know that Jesus is the soon coming king. Are you hearing me? He came as a king who died for the rest of the kings, for the nation, for the kingdom. And those who will call on his name can come back into his kingdom, have all the liberties that come with his kingdom when they do what's necessary to receive the forgiveness that has been laid out. And when he does, he'll say, now I'm going to judge you according to this new life in me. How well did you follow me? That's what my reward's on. That's why he said when you get before him, it could be wood, hay, and stubble. Meaning you did something on the earth that somebody recognized and it was really only for them. It wasn't for Jesus. They gave you honor, rewards, accolades. They clapped for you, stand in ovation, but your heart was to do it so they would recognize you. When you stand before the Lord and said, yeah, I saw that moment. It was a selfish ambition. I get that. And you know, you got that reward. There's nothing here. But now when you do it for him, man can applaud you, give you rewards, give you great honor, but it can also then translate up into his realm and says, man, not only did you get that, you know, benefit, you know, dinner where everybody, you know, was talking all awesome and it was amazing, but the whole while you were just serving me, so I got some treasures I'm going to hand out as well. Amen. But then there's the great white throne. And all these individuals, it's not because forgiveness is not available. It's because they fail to do what the Bible says causes forgiveness to take place. Are you hearing me? Because I hear people all the time, well, you just need to forgive them. Well, what does that even mean then? Because has God not forgiven us? I mean, what did he say on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they do. Well, does that mean everybody's forgiven now? There's no responsibility on our end. Why is Jesus telling his disciples to wait and don't even minister about me and be a witness for me until you are clothed with power on high? Don't even preach yet. Why does he say it's through the uh, foolishness of preaching that people get born again if the blood that's forgiven everybody of their sin is already on the mercy seat? What's the reason? Acts chapter 26, 15 to 18 says this, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now this is the encounter of Saul of Tarsus with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He said, but get up and stand on your feet for this purpose I've appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only uh, to the things which you have seen but, of the, uh, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm, I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith. Now, when we put these two passages together, Acts In Colossians, notice in Colossians it said that because of what Jesus did, he's qualified us to share with an inheritance. Paul is going to go preach to let them know they have an inheritance that they've been qualified for. Are you hearing me? I said, are you hearing me? Okay. Now, in that, some things have to take place because, because Jesus has qualified us in Colossians' letter, he's already developed, he's already put in place a rescue plan. It's the way of escape that gets you out of the domain, the power, the authority of living like a sinner and having the nature of the devil and move you over into the kingdom of his beloved son where you have the nature of God. 
Are you hearing me? And he, he, he established this escape route by paying for this um, way with his blood. that has the door to forgive you of sin. And sin is treason against God's kingdom. It's your way, not the king's way. It's treason. And from a kingdom perspective. And then here, Paul has the same responsibility to, to help people have their eyes open so they can leave darkness and turn to light. Leave the domain of Satan to God. The dominion of Satan, the power, the authority of a tyrannical ruler and father. Because remember, Jesus said, not all of y'all are God's kids. I mean, if you actually read the Bible, you'll know that God doesn't look at the earth and say, these are all God's people. He doesn't say that. He talked to the Pharisees and said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, God and the devil are not the same person. God, the Father, does not have a split personality that one day he's God the Father good and the next day he's Satan. So Jesus is not confused when he's telling human beings, you're not godly and you're not of the God's seed. You're not of my daddy. We're not in the same family. Now, you were originally created to be in it, but because you have fallen in sin, because you are rebellious to God, because you do it your way, You are not in my household, and you are not of my father. He told them, he said, if, if you were of my father, you would accept me. But you're not. Amen. I'm glad that I got a new dad. I said, I'm glad I got a new dad. But in both places, we see there's a, uh, or Paul begins to highlight and let us know something has to take place in order for things to, to turn. He said that they may turn, that they may turn. Now, let me get in a little bit further, and we'll see it even more in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 34, this is Peter going to Cornelius' house, okay? And we'll pick it up in verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. And we're going to see what John proclaimed here in a minute. You know of Jesus, of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit, with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of these things. He did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he became, become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living, of the living and the... So it's obvious that the blood he's put on the mercy seat in heaven, although it has the ability and the power to forgive every sin that was ever created by anyone... Yet, he will still judge dead people. People who do not receive that forgiveness. As far as Jesus is concerned, he could say, I've forgiven you. But what does that do for you? What does that do for you? Knowing that God's forgiving you does nothing for you if you do not do what's required to receive it. Now, I know religious minds start running right now, and that's why, because they don't want to take personal responsibility. And they actually like their worldly living. And so as a result of that, they feel comforted in their shallow um, 
explanation of the word that God did it. I couldn't have done anything. He's already forgiven me. And, you know, I just go through life knowing that, you know, Jesus paid it all. And, man, when I am done, I, I would have done enough that, you know, God's going to take me in. How could he deny me? Well, he'll deny you. I said he'll deny you, although he paid for it all. Because you don't get in that way. I said you don't get in that way. And the Bible doesn't teach that you get the forgiveness that way. Even though, by all rights, he's forgiven sin. All right, we're going to touch on some things here in a minute. Verse 43. Of whom all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. Everyone who what? Believes. What? Believes. Now, I would love <laughs> for this word belief to just mean believe. In fact, that's what a lot of the religious churches want you to believe. All you got to do is believe in him and you receive forgiveness of sin. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said this, even the demons believe and tremble. But how many demons are getting forgiveness of sin? So this can't be this, I believe Jesus came. I believe Jesus is a godly person. That doesn't give you forgiveness of sin. In fact, you're not forgiven of your sin at all, even though there's provision for all your sins to be forgiven. Well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Whoopee! Big deal. The devils know he is the Son of God. In fact, they ran and said, you know, have you come to torment us before our time? We know who you are. We know who you are. Amen? Well, I, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Big deal. That doesn't give you forgiveness of sin. Doesn't give it to you. You know how many people you can walk at your work and stuff and you, oh, well, I believe in God. Big deal. You're not forgiven of your sin. Big deal. You're still going to go to the lake of fire. You're still going. Believing there's a God means nothing. Believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God doesn't mean anything. That's right. That's good. That is not what the Bible says because the Bible is very clear of what it takes to receive. Yes. Paul lets them know, now listen, this thing hinges on what Paul, John, has been preaching. Yeah. Now, how did John preach? Turn over to Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of of what? Repentance. Repentance for the forgiveness of sin. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. Why do you have to have repentance? It's for. Without repentance, there is no application to be able to receive what Jesus has already forgiven you. Yes, that's right. that's good. What he's already provided. Doesn't matter. He's already provided it. Doesn't matter. If you don't qualify through repentance. Now, repentance is not a religious word. Repentance means to change your thinking. It literally means side with my party. <laughs> Y'all doing all right? Yes. Look at this, Matthew 1, through our chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. John the Baptist, now in the days of John the Baptist, came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's how he said it. Mark lets us know he, it, was a, it was a message of the baptism of repentance, and that's what he, in, in the Matthew gospel, he just led with repent. Change your thinking. Side with God's party. Yeah. When I mean party, it's not like come have a party. It has implications of political or governmental party. 
meaning you've been in a domain or a rulership that has kept you cut off from God and had you rebellious from God. But if you'll change the way you live, the way you think, the way you respond, the way you act, the way you Lord it yourself and submit to his lordship. You got to change your thinking and come over to the kingdom. You got to submit your will to his will. It is no longer, you got to quit thinking, I got this, I can do this. You got to change that thinking. You can't do it without him. And you got to submit to him. And then when you submit to him, you can do whatever he says. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 47. And he said to them, this is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. How in the world do we receive the forgiveness of sin? We must repent. Yes. Did Jesus himself not preach this? In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to uh, preach and say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can't live like this and expect that you've been forgiven. Okay. This lifestyle is not tolerated in my domain. So you have to change that entirely. Give it up. Abandon it. You have to denounce it and turn to my way and my way alone. And when you do that from your innermost being, you'll receive forgiveness. The blood can be applied. You cannot hang out over in the domain of darkness. Pull the blood of Jesus over on you here. Still live this way and expect when you die, wake up here. I'm going to pull it over here. God forgave me. He's already done. I couldn't do nothing. I'm still going to drink on the weekend. Still going to smoke on the weekend. Still going to whore on the weekend. Still going to backbite. Still going to gossip. Well, that nature, that's all that nature can do. And you can't pull his blood over into this realm and think you got something when you don't have it until you repent. You'd be like, I got, this man's got to die. This man has to die. I can't live. This is horror. The condition I am is filthy rags. He should, he should throw me into, but I will give all of my allegiance and my will and my following and my conduct and my behavior. I'll yield and submit. I'll do it, Lord. I believe it. I believe that your blood has the power to change everything about me and I'm ready, willing. I repent. I don't want it no more. The Lord said, well, come on in, son. Then our spirit man becomes new. The old is pressed out of our body. We become a new creature in Christ. Then the Holy Ghost comes and lives on the inside and said, now I'm going to clean your mind up because people who've received forgiveness actually live a lifestyle of repentance. This is why John the Baptist rightly judged the Pharisees when he said, he said, who do you think you are escaping the wrath of God? You brought a viper's. And they would act like, yeah, but we've got Abraham. We've got Mo. He says, listen, you need to live a lifestyle in keeping with repentance. Because a person repented, you don't have to beg them to come to church. You don't have to beg them to read the Bible. You don't have to beg them to, to pray. You don't have to beg them to crucify the flesh. They're like, I got to get that off me. That's not my life. I don't think that way anymore. Whatever you say, I'll change. And in my growth and walk with God, he said, change this. I'm going to change that today. Change this. I'm going to change it. I never in my walk have come along and say, no. Nah, now listen, I've done a lot for you so far, and this is as far as I go. 
I mean, I want a little bit of me on the inside somewhere. There is no me without him. In him I live and move and have my being. His words have life. And I cannot habitually have forgiveness unless I repent. See, this is where we get duped, is that we think because now we're in. All of a sudden, there's nothing else we do. Yet, in the old covenant, every year, they had to sacrifice another. God said to us, listen, you blow it, the blood's still flowing. Repent and ask me to forgive you. You don't have to wait for the high priest to come. You don't have to wait. You can get it every day. You can get forgiveness every day. It's every day. And I'm ready to dish it out. But you are not going to keep this kind of life and thinking that's outside my kingdom. And think you're going to walk in forgiveness. That you're going to have it applied. Are you hearing me? See, religious forgiveness comes without a need to change. But the kingdom forgiveness comes only through repentance. You know what? Some churches are so stupid. They think, I'm talking, you know, before certain things, that, you know, if you weren't wearing a suit, like holiness is in a suit. I wear a suit because I like it. But it's gotten just as crazy thinking that you can't wear a suit anymore and identify with people. Because most are so laid back wearing their pajamas have no thought about being in front of a king. And a lot of times their outward display is really displaying their inward heart of this little casual relationship with God. Living in the world and saying, oh, but he's forgiven me. Well, is it a plot? Is it to your account? Because without repentance, you don't have it. See, God has already forgiven you. But it's clear to say God has provided forgiveness for you. Receive it by repenting. Matthew 18. Y'all doing all right? Yes. Okay, 21 to 22. Look at this. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, do not say up to seven times but up to 70 times seven. Now, let's look at this because when you read this, this is, the please, this is the problem. Do, make sure you always take what God's saying in context. Because again, what's the implication here? If we just read this scripture, then we take the one side that doesn't allow forgiveness to be applied. If my brother sins before me seven times, how many times do, do I forgive him? Seven times, right? Jesus said, I don't say seven, I say 70 times seven. So again, all that the scripture says, that if your brother sins, well, he sinned against me. Well, I'll forgive him. And like, that's it, you're done. Well, I'll just forgive him. But Jesus says this somewhere else, and it reads differently. Are you hearing me? Let's look at it here in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 3. He said, be on your guard if your brother, what? What's the next two words? Oh, hallelujah. Say amen anyway. Well, God forgave him. He poured out his blood. I mean, they're in sin. I'm, I, you know, I forgive them. And we walk away and act like, you know, they're forgiven of what they've done wrong. No, it says if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he... If is a conditional statement. Now listen, you're not holding. You have ample provision. God forgave me, I'll forgive them. No problem with me. But yet they can't receive it if they don't repent. And if he... Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. Fine, it's fine. Why? Because it's just too easy to be irresponsible. To stay in a watered down, sissy, mamby, pamby. This is the reason why our world looks like it looks like. Because again, we tolerate things that the kingdom, that the king himself does not tolerate. 
And this is not being unmerciful. This is not being without compassion. This is not being long-suffering. This is not being impatient. This is being full of love. Hey, we're in another kingdom here now. And at the end of the day, some things need to change here. And if they don't change, the Bible says, take two or three. And then they say, there can become conditions where you're like, I take this before the church. Then if they still won't repent, I'm going to treat you like you're not even a part of the church. And when you go on social media and say, I ostracized you and I cut you off and I wasn't merciful to you. No, you didn't list all the times I came and asked you to change, repent, change, do what the word says, brought people around, was long suffering, trying to help out. But now I'm obligated by the king to put you out and love puts you out because love put Adam out of the garden. Let me smile. Yeah. I mean, the church has got to get a fear of the Lord again, this reverential awe that I want to live like God wants me to live. I want to do what God wants me to do. Oh, get dirty stuff off me. Oh, my gosh, get that off me. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to think that way. I don't behave that way. That's disgusting. Now, let me see how much I can dabble over here and get away with it. And people sit thinking, well, I'm, I'm good with God. You ain't good with God if you're not repentant. And even if you're born again, you're not good with God. What you're doing is setting yourself up to go to the judgment seat and have absolutely no reward. Because you won't live a consistent life with the character of the Holy One that's on the inside of you because you fail. You fail to change your thinking on how you're going to handle this situation. You're going to do it your way. My, my, my. He said, listen, if he repents, forgive him, and if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying what? What's he saying? You know what he's not saying? Oh, forgive me. Will you forgive? I mean, I, again, you blown, I'm going to ask, have you, are you, are you repenting? Has repentance taken place? I mean, these kind of truths get me very concerned as a pastor that maybe people aren't where they think they are. This is why it's very obvious that when James says, listen, you need to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, because a lot of people are hearing this word and they live in this word and they live in deceived lives, which means they're born again, deceived, thinking they're right with God and they ain't right with God because God cannot give them any reward because they're not pulling the blood from the mercy seat of God through repentance. You know, Father, you've been talking to me for the last month about dealing with my attitude towards this person at work. And honestly, I feel like I'm justified. I mean, I really just, the way they are, I, I'm so short with them. But you know what? I got to repent. I need to do it your way. Will you forgive me? I'm going to do it your way, even at the cost of what it looks like I'm caving. I could give multiple examples of where people aren't repenting. And repenting is a big deal to God. It's a big deal. It is interest to the kingdom. Let's finish out Matthew 18. Jump back over there. Verse 23. Now he's going to give an example. He just said, hey, uh, my brother sins against me, oh, let's say up to seven times. Should I forgive him? He said, I wouldn't say seven. I'd say 70 times seven. And then he qualifies. Now, the reason why you would give, you would, in essence, he's saying, you should always have a heart to forgive your brother when he repents. Although you are already in a posture of forgiveness, meaning I'm not offended with you that you've sinned against me. I'm not all upset. You're not going to put strings on me to be mad. I am already ready to forgive you. I just need you to repent. Well, now, brother, you need to forgive him. I've already forgiven him. I remember one particular person didn't left the church not too great years ago. Two years later, give me a call and repents. And I told him, I said, I forgive you because I forgave you already. So for two years, you're walking under something 
that you didn't have to be under if you only would have repented. Because it was there the minute you blew it. Same thing with God. The forgiveness is there the minute you blew it. How many, how many born again people are not coming to church? Because they're condemned with what they've done wrong. And the devil starts hounding them. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But they begin to hound. And, they, and you know how you get rid of that? You repent. If you're truly repentant, you won't be beat up. You'll be guilt free. Even though you know forgiveness is there. How can we have walked in such a great salvation and not stay connected to this? And that like some failure along the way, there's only one failure along the way for the believer that there is no forgiveness that God himself will not forgive. And that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. That isn't for lost people. That is for born again people that ha qualify for that. And there's conditions that qualify you for that one. And by all rights, the Bible says you've openly trampled on the blood of Jesus as a result of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. But the majority, I mean, I would say such a, it's such a minute fraction that go, falls into the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost category. Most of it is just the believer's failure to know that the blood is on the mercy seat and all I have to do is repent and be free from this guilt. How can you be carrying guilt if you know God's forgiven you? If you know that he's removed your sin as far as the east is from the west, yet you do something wrong, you feel guilty, you don't come to church. You don't talk to people, you won't look people in the eye anymore. You avoid them. Because we're like, well, God forgave me. I'm going to do it. You know, well, God forgave me. Well, you, you've not received it because you're still doing the same stuff you've been doing that makes you feel this way. And then you know it comes from the believer that even the lost use. Don't judge me. All right? Well, let me just give you a little biblical advice. Read it. Because the Bible actually gives saints the right to judge you. It's called judging your fruit. Now, I'm not judging your eternal destination. That I have no right. But I sure have the right to say, let me taste your fruit here. This is garbage. There's no love in that. There's no joy there. That fruit tastes so depressed. It was so bitter. You need to repent. You walk around here like Eeyore. Yeah, the Bible says the joy of the Lord's your strength. And then you're mad at me because I'm like, where's your joy? Yeah. Don't tell me about What's wrong with you? <laughs> repent. Yes. Repent. All we want is repent. All God wants is all of us just to yes. repent. I mean, quit getting all haughty. Yes. Like nobody in the room's never blown it. We've all blown it. But I'm telling you, you aren't free unless you repent. All right, verse 23. Coming off, how many times do I forgive him? Seven times? No, I'd say 70 times seven. He says, for this reason. For this reason. What reason? 70 times seven, you forgive your brother. If he comes to you and repents. If he comes to you and repents, you're going to forgive for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay it, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children, all that he had, and repayment be made. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor Earl, this has to do with money. Don't you understand your sin has to do with financial currency? You were redeemed. Redeem means bought with a price. The Bible says that you were bought, bought with a price. You were redeemed not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood. So in essence, you're this guy. You had a debt that you had no ability to repay. Okay, just so we're clear. So... The slave fell to the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll repay you everything. And the Lord 
of the slave felt compassion and released him and 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 forgave him the debt but say but say but but the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarian now he owed 10,000 talents and this guy only owed a hundred denarian okay he seized him and began to choke him saying pay back what you owe so his fellow slave fell to the ground, began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I'll repay you. But he was, he's unwilling. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said, you wicked slave, I, what did I do? What did I do? Well, did he forgive him or not? Y'all don't want to hear this. Did he forgive him or not? When that slave left the presence of the Lord the first time, did he owe him 10,000 talents anymore? When he stands before him the second time, does he owe him 10,000 talents? Nope. I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your slave in the same way? And the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all. Now what does he owe him now? It's not 10,000 talents. What does he owe him? He owed him the character of the Lord. He didn't respond like his Lord. He didn't live a life in keeping with repentance and responded like his Lord. Okay. Mark chapter 11, have faith in God. Speech of the mountain, cast into the sea, it's done. Do you have the same faith of God, right? Okay. Same faith of God. Are you hearing me? Do you have that? You can have the same faith of God, verse 25. But if you got any issue with somebody, you need to go forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, your Father in heaven... So the price of character is worth more than talents. Okay. Jesus, when he redeemed us from the curse of the law, brought us out of the domain of darkness, what did he deposit in you? His character, his ability, his nature. And that nature will repent and be like the Father. It's lifestyle. So you don't, don't think you can be over here skipping around living like the devil way and don't think there's not a debt to settle. All right. I'm not talking about you lose your salvation the minute you blow it. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, the minute you blow it, there is a way for you to wash that guilt because you don't have to wait for the priest to come next year. There's plenty of blood rolling. He tells him, you're going to owe me all. In essence, it's as if you've, you've fallen into a debt bigger than you can pay again. He said, my heavenly father will also. Oh, okay. Okay. Y'all doing all right? I mean, I want to finish. <laughs> Boy, we've been really religiously taught a bunch of forgiveness, apparently. My heavenly father. Who's heavenly father? Oh. Who's my? Jesus. He is yours too, but Jesus is talking here. He said, my daddy will also do the same to you. If, here's the condition. If you meet this condition, 
You don't want, my gosh. I didn't think I'd be plowing so hard in my own church. This is crazyville. My heavenly father will do the same to you if, if, if you meet this condition, if each of you does not forgive his brother, where? From his heart. Well, God forgave me of my sin. I went up and repented, asked Jesus to come to my heart and save me. Yet you have ought with your brother. You know you have ought with your brother, and you think that entrance is inevitable. All the junk you've done? Seriously. All the, all the, the garbage we did against God? All the sin that is rightly that we could have never paid in a lifetime, in an in a eternity. Can't do it. Think about this. This whole thing is about taking a person, putting them in prison to be tortured until the debt's paid. What happens when people fall into the lake of fire? Is it like vacation land, just warmer? Are they not going to be in torment? When will they pay that debt? <laughs> never. It's never going to happen. And here's someone who was forgiven of what their wrongdoing was to the crown, but yet because they wouldn't forgive their own. Not showing the nature I'm telling you, Lord, search their hearts right now. Search it, Lord. I'm telling you, if, if, if you knew so, there was something going on in you with somebody, you need to repent. It is not acceptable for a child of God to hold an offense and be bitter towards a brother. It's not. Even if they've done you wrong, if they've repented, you have to treat them as if they've never done it to you personally. You can't bring it up at family meetings. Can't bring it up at work. You can't talk about it like it happened yesterday. And if you're entertaining someone who does that, you're just at fault. You should be saying, you need to shut your mouth about that because you understand they're under the blood. I mean, you ought to at least be a peacemaker. Okay, what? Have they, have they repented? They asked you to, well, you know what? Why don't we go see them right now? Because at the end of the day, you need to be ever ready to forgive, which if you are, you wouldn't be talking about this. But now if they've actually come to you and say, I repent that I did that then you should be talking about them equally as well, and you should be embracing them as if they never did it. Right. Let's just be real. Get real, Pastor. I'm real. More real than you want right now, apparently. More real than you want. It's a wicked thing. It's a wicked thing to think that you're justified to hold someone to their account of failure. It's a wicked thing. Whew. All right, let me finish this up. Praise the Lord. Well, we had some shouting earlier, so that was fun. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 41. This is the launching of the church age. Okay. Peter said to them, what did he say? Repent. And each, of, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for cannot get the forgiveness of sin if you do not repent. You cannot sit in church and have forgiveness. You cannot come with someone who has received forgiveness and you get some of their account. Yeah. 
and you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and all for all for, uh, who are afar, far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people repented that day. Although there were more people in the crowd who knows forgiveness is available. But did not receive because they did not repent. I close with 1 John 1, 9. This is probably one of our most popular YouTube ones. <laughs> share it anyway. If it was like, mm, share it. Grab it, share it, put it on your Facebook, throw it out on your Instagram, push this one. You wouldn't want people to be going to hell because they falsely think they're forgiven and they've not actually accessed the account. If, condition, if we confess our sin, this is not to unbelievers. Paul is writing to brethren. He said, if we confess our sins, here's the thing. How do we know these are the two of the church and not to unbelievers? Because unbelievers could never confess all their sins. They have no idea how many things they've done wrong. They just know they've done wrong. Now, they can recall some recent things, more traumatic things. I get it. But at the end of the day, they're not recalling everything they've ever done. But a believer has capacity because the Holy Ghost lives and says, oh, whoa, wait, that ain't right. That's rebellion. That's rebellious right there. Stop that. You need to shut your mouth. You need to quit acting that way. Now, I got some fruit for you. Now you need to repent. You need to change the way you're handling the situation right now. You need to just shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Be quick to hear, slow to shut up. Shut up shutting up. <laughs> some of you need to shut up shutting up. All right. If we confess our sins, he is, what is he? Faithful and righteous to? Why? Because the blood's there already. You can, go in, you can go, boldly go before the throne of grace anytime you want to and have help in your time of need. And man, when we aren't doing right, we need to repent and get forgiveness. To, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all Unrighteousness is not a religious word. It is doing that which is against what the governing authority says. And God says, don't talk to your wife like that. You need to stop and go, honey, I repent. First, Father, I repent. I should not have said that to my wife. Forgive me. Oh, I received it. I got it. Honey, I repent. Please forgive me. Now, whether she accepts my repentance or not is not on me. But I'm definitely putting her in a position and vice versa that I need to demonstrate what my Heavenly Father freely did for me. And this is why we don't have problems. Because when problems come, we repent and get it under the blood. Because we know I don't have a right to be angry. I can't take this personal. At the end of the day, God forgave me. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to repent. I'm going to do it God's way. Because that's what brings life to our marriage. Yes. And I just want life. Because God's given me someone better in silver and gold. And I'm not going to forfeit that. I'll just repent. So flesh, shut up. Hallelujah. Say amen anyway. <laughs> but yet, you know what people do? You have to forgive me. I don't have to forgive you till you repent. This ain't a question about my forgiveness. The question is about your repentance. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. Next time someone put, well, yeah, you just need to forgive them. Well, they'll receive it once they repent. Now, you just need to act like they didn't do it. How can I act like they didn't do it? They haven't repented. 
Well, now, honey, let's just all get around and let's be just a good big family, all right? Because, again, we just got to forgive each other. I would love to forgive them. I got it sitting on ready, but they've not repented. And while you're sitting around acting like everyone's forgiven, it's not actually being applied to everyone. So there are many people at your work that you have an overflow of forgiveness, but they're not repenting. And it's not an issue with you. They don't own you. You're not tied to it. You're not holding in the context that you are um, mean to them. You still treat them with kindness and do exactly what God says. But sometimes God may say, don't even hang out with that one. Well, how come you don't hang out with me? You know, I mean, honestly, it's obvious that you don't care for me. And as much as I've tried to get along, we just don't. So it's just better that we don't. And that's not because, oh, well, I thought you were a Christian. I am, and that's what I've been instructed by the king, because <laughs> you won't repent. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Jesus does not accept your rebellion. He doesn't accept it. He doesn't accept you as you are. The Lord just accepts you as you are. No, he won't. He accepts you at your repentance. Yes. I'm going to say that again. He does not accept you as you are. He accepts you at your repentance. Your acknowledgement, my junk's off. I'm getting under your way. Let's pray. Father, with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one's looking around. You don't get there any other way but through repentance. So I'm going to be crystal clear. If you have never acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, literally, not a good man, not a prophet, I mean literally God in the flesh, who came to the earth, born of a virgin Mary, because the Holy Ghost got her pregnant. He lived a perfect sinless life, never disobeyed God, yet took on all of your wrongdoing, died on a cross because that was the instrument for execution, freely gave up his life for your rebellion, went to the grave for three days on your behalf, and by the power of the Holy Ghost raised him from the dead. Then he took his own blood that was poured and put it on the mercy seat in heaven. And that if you will believe that and then confess, and this is repentance, you are Lord, you are supreme in authority. It's not my way. It is only your way. And I must do it your way because I've been doing it my way and I want you to accept me the way I do it. If that's you, you're going to hell. You're going to hell if you've never, if you have not repented. You're going to hell. You're going to be eternally judged, thrown into the lake of fire. You're going to stand before God and say, Lord, didn't I give this person that? And didn't I do this? And didn't I, you know, you know, pray this prayer, you know, with beads? And didn't I, you know, give to the church here? And didn't I give to this organization here? And the Lord's like, depart from me. I never knew you. Because your life was not mine. You had religion. Aren't I good enough? I mean, ain't I doing enough? It costs you your life. And the one you have is not good and you know it. But the one he wants to give you is amazing. It's so amazing, it should compel you at the sensing in your spirit. My, I'm running down there, man. I'm going to do it. You'll be free from it all. You'll get free from, from gossip, backbiting. You'll get free from, from condemnation. You'll get free from guilt. You'll get free from anything you've ever done wrong. You'll get free from it all. Because he'll set you free. Because his blood will actually be applied to your life. He'll turn it all around. But you must willfully say, I'm giving my whole life to Jesus. He is supreme in authority and I follow him the rest of my days.